but let me just say, you know, welcome everybody to our first uh, session of Step House. Uh, it's exciting to have you here today. Um, this new series is for us to talk about uh, projects in tech um, and to hear from you as developers in our community um, uh, to talk around, you know, shared topics and interests. Um, and so what I'll do now is just hand things over to Simon and Ali to, to kick off our, our conversation. Uh, so welcome and, and let's get started. Great. Thanks, Daniel. So Ali, welcome and thanks for joining us on DevHouse. Yeah, First thanks all, for having me. We want to get to know, you know, a bit about yourself. Why don't you mm -hmm. tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, I've been a software developer for about five years. Uh, I'm fully self-taught. I did an electrical engineering degree, so I learned everything I did on my own. Um, and I'm, currently I'm working at a company called Auth0. Uh, I work for the office of the CTO working on new product lines. Awesome. So what kind of, I guess, prompted you to start this project? Yeah. So, uh, the thing about me is like when I was a software developer, uh, like I wasn't, I didn't do the traditional route of software development. I did, uh, like I was mostly self-taught. So the only thing that I had for my experience was doing projects. Like the only way I got my very first job in the industry was based on my personal projects, like my portfolio, rather than my experience. Like no one gave a crap about my experience. They were just so interested in doing mm -hmm. projects. So what, so like the biggest thing that kind of drove me and the thing that drives me to do these projects every day is just to make sure that I'm like still very competitive in the market. I, every time I do a project, it's always working on new technologies that I'm like super interested in. Um, and this is probably the first project that will ever charge, you know, actually incentivized to create money from not, not because, because I've just never done that type of scope before. everything I've always done is like open source. Um, and I think it's, this is kind of a, a need that's kind of there, um, in a very small scale, but it could be useful for people that are looking for this kind of solution. So why don't you tell us a bit about this project, you know, for the context and everybody here? Oh, yeah. So I. Time. In the email, it's called Project Mango Starbreeze because I just needed to think of a name when I create the GitHub repo, and that's the name that GitHub gave me. So I'm like, I'm gonna go with it. <laughs> but in reality, I bought a I bought a domain name. It's called PaidMe.xyz, and it's basically like a, a donation platform on steroids. So if you're like a content creator, or an artist, uh, a video production person, anything that has to do with any sort of digital asset, you can basically go in. Um, and create these things called links and essentially charge money for any type of digital content you want. So like for me, um, there's also like a component to it, which is like a link tree where you can post your profile and you can post all the links that you have there so people can contact you directly and pay for them. Um, so for me, like I always have recruiters reaching out to me for positions and I know my resume is really valuable. So I would post my resume as a paid asset on there. So if recruiters really want my resume, they can pay for it and get it to me and I'll hmm. donate the proceeds to a charity, like stuff like that. It's it's made for people to sell stuff like that. Another what, uh, useful thing is Zoom links. Like if you're doing like an event, and you want people to pay for it, you can put your Zoom link as a paid asset. And once they've filled their pay payment, you, they get the Zoom link back in an email so they can go and tend your event. So it's so just made for that. So is the concept kind of like it's a SaaS service that kind of provides something similar to let's say Bitly where you kind of are able to generate links, but then mm -hmm. these links have a paywall in front of it. Exactly, that's exactly it. Yeah, and awesome. you can you can generate links by adding like assets, like like any type of file you want, zip files, there's no restrictions. You could do text-based links. Like if, let's say you're doing like a speakeasy and you have a secret password to get into your speakeasy, you can put that password in and send that link and people can pay for it and get that uh, password, stuff like that. Very digital focused. Interesting. No, so I guess that makes sense. So then you're basically, the problem you're trying to solve is be able to protect some of your assets behind and have it still be shareable, but you know, be able to control kind of how that kind of goes out to the internet. Yeah, kind of like a paid captcha, I would say. But yeah, like captcha. I said, I'm not trying to solve a problem that's going to like revolutionize the world. I'm not a company with a mantra that's like really trying to enforce this. This is like a very small, I would call it a micro SaaS, where I'm learning as much as I can from this project. And if I make $10, I think this is a success. You see nice. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that no, makes perfect sense. I mean, especially for a project that you're just kind of starting on the side. Yeah, so exactly. Why don't we switch into the stack? You know, I'm interested mm. now that, you know, given the context that you're building yeah. this awesome side projects, yeah. what did you choose to use and why? Yeah, so I chose a bunch of technologies, um, but I went for a very non-traditional, oh, what is becoming very popular now, which is a no cloud solution, because you have to think about these projects and how they're gonna be maintained, even if they go into production, right? 
I am the only person working on this. And it is going to be like that for the rest of its project life cycle. So I don't want to use a very expensive cloud hosting website where I have to do Terraform and manage a bunch of, bunch of cloud services of myself, right? So I went a very different route. So what I'm using is, and I also want it to be very cost effective. I don't want to pay thousands of dollars for hosting for something that I want to scale to millions of people, right? So what I decided to do was I use Vercel for my hosting solution and Vercel provides a framework called Next.js, which allows you to create React websites, right? And then for my database, I had to look for something with a very generous free tier. And one of those is PlanetScale. They have a free tier that has 30 gigabytes of space and a million reads and a million writes. I think it's more than that now. That's what it was when I was looking at it, um, which is great. Like for me, I can still generate money and not pay for data for a long, long time. And when I do, it's only 20 bucks a month, right? Right. Really just, for, just for context, but I guess the audience, yeah. uh, PlanetScale, right? That's a MySQL-based, cloud-based Exactly, database but it's, right. it's a MySQL database that's built on a very popular open source technology called Vitus. And it's like this way to horizontally scale a relational database, which is in practice very hard to do because your data right. is so tightly coupled, right? So right. PlanetScale doesn't really enforce foreign keys, but they do a lot of other cool things that Vitus provides. Like they have this thing called branching. You can branch your database schema as like you would do branching on a GitHub PR or a GitHub right. repo and you can merge stuff. And this way I can like create changes on my dev branch and my database, merge it back to my production branch without causing outages, right? Because database schemas, especially relational ones are notorious for being very picky. You have to be very careful when you make changes. So it's really good at that. It's a developer focused MySQL, like extremely scalable way. So if I, let's say hit a million users, people are like, I want to put my resume behind the paywall for whatever reason they want to do that, right? <laughs> and if they decide to use my platform and if they get that load, I don't have to worry about, it. I have to create like AWS alerts to figure out how my services are doing. Vercel is handling the load and Planet Skills is handling my data infrastructure. I, I sleep easy, not worrying about that stuff. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, so this is pretty interesting because you picked a pretty modern, I guess, stack in the sense where it's like a serverless, you know, front end solution. Absolutely. It scales according to the amount of dollars you want to spend essentially to run serverless functions. Well, exactly. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then for payments, I'm always using just Stripe because I, I fully support Stripe. It's a very easy to use platform. And then for authentication, I'm obviously using the company that I work for, Auth0. They, they gave me an awesome free tier <laughs> and it's a win-win for them. Like when I use their product and I do open source, like I do marketing on LinkedIn for my product, guess what? Auth0 gets free marketing from that because I am a developer that actively uses a product and they get free benefits from it. Right. Mm -hmm. So then I guess the interesting part too, I guess, is there probably needs to be, I guess, files stored to back up these layers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there some sort of file storage mechanism? I do, yeah. And it's, so the most traditional one people use is called S3 because like, you know, that's right. like the Amazon. traditional exactly. link. It's too expensive. Yeah. You got to make it even cheaper. <laughs> What's the cheapest one you can find, right? So yeah. a cool thing that a lot of uh, file storage companies started doing is they started making compatible APIs with S3. So you could use the S3 SDK to do everything you want, but you can use way cheaper solutions. And one of them is Backblaze. It is almost, I would say, a one-fourth of the price of Amazon S3. It's 0.005 cents per gigabyte of storage and 0.01 cent per gigabyte of download. So it's basically free for me to host this stuff and even send the, even if I make $10 selling my resume, that's a fat margin I've gained from like just storage costs. They also support like signed URLs. So it's not really hard for you to integrate solutions for you to upload and download files. Like they'll handle all that for you. Yeah. Nice. I guess mm -hmm. the other two parts I could, I'm interested in is since you're providing the links out to these services, right? Are you getting notifications back in some form? Is there some form of analytics that has integration into your application and maybe emails or notifications of some sort? Yeah, so so since like you pay for a pay for a digital asset, instead of you getting like a URL directly through your payment, uh, you actually get an email that you can track and just like a receipt. And it's also a way for you to access that. And for those emails, I could have used like NodeMod, but I just decided to do SendGrid. They also have a very generous free tier. They do a hundred emails a day for free. And if I need to go more, it's about 15 bucks US for me to like really scale if I need to. It's a developer focused SDK. Again, super easy to use, super easy to integrate, right? The biggest thing for me is like lower cost and very ease of use. I was able to build this whole project in like a couple of weeks without me ever worrying about infrastructure and how it's gonna scale. Nice. Mm -hmm. So then, yeah, it sounds like you have a pretty nice stack, you know, going here. I guess, what are kind of some of the biggest problems you face, I guess, you know, why you're kind of developing this app? Because you pull the stuff off the shelf, you have a bunch of SaaS yeah. services, <laughs> everything's there. <laughs> you know, time you get commands, you're good to go, right? 
Yeah. I think there's, there's, there's a couple of issues with doing something. Well, first of all, um, how do you do dev on these types of services where, which are all cloud-based, right? Like I think a dev environment setup is really still very complicated because everything has their own CLI. Um, you have to run all these CLI, like Stripe has its own CLI so that you can call webhooks locally. Planet Scale has their own CLI so you can talk to the database locally. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of stuff that you get in like a very image traditional enterprise solution where everything's an image and it runs locally as Docker Compose or in a Kubernetes cluster running locally. You don't get that with this stuff, right? You have to create custom scripts to run custom CLI commands, which is really like tedious. It's not the best. Um, so I, that's kind of like some of the bigger, bigger challenges. Um, that I've faced, just like developer tooling around the project itself, right? And then when I deploy, right. like the amount of API keys I have to manage is insane. It's like 12, 13, 14 <laughs> API keys. So I have to like remember, okay, I'm using this service. I have to go into Vercel, make sure that service exists there and so on and so forth. So just like the, like just bootstrapping is a little bit difficult. So is Vercel kind of handling your entire pipeline? Because I guess in this case, there's no actual backbone towards this, right? Because, you know, you, yeah. it's a single click from your GitHub repo from Vercel to deploy onto... Yep, your next year's exactly. project, then, then to That's set it. up your authentication, it's all hooked up. You, you're doing it all within you know, that realm, I guess, right? Yeah, so, and the best part of Vercel is like, if I, when I continue to make it in production, I'll be putting a lot of PRs myself, even though I'm doing it myself. But right. each PR, Vercel will generate a URL for that specific right. environment. So I can test right. it local. I can test that right away. And that's all free. I'm not paying for that service. It's all embedded inside the Vercel platform, right? Interesting. So then it sounds like at least the tech, the tech part, you kind of just got to work around you know, the little nuances between each you know, service provider, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, if there's any breaking changes and so on and so forth. I was using PlanetScale when still in beta, and now they officially have a release candidate, they're fully out and they're charging customers and so on and so forth. Um, I haven't noticed any changes, but there is still issues going forward where if I'm using, let's say PlanetScale and they change a major API change, well, guess what? I have to go in my source code and modify all that stuff. Even though I have really good abstractions around my services, yeah. there still could be really big complications later down the road. So were there any, I guess, concerns that were kind of outside the tech stack that, you know, you had to kind of think about? Because right now you're a one person team and, mm -hmm. you know, and I assume it's going to stay this way because this is your pet project essentially right now at this point, right? Yeah. But, you know, was there anything else outside of like the, you know, setup, let's say, or the configuration? I think I think when you're selling a digital asset, you have to also be very careful about security because you don't want people to just be able to guess URLs and then gain access to that like asset. And that's still something like I really struggle with. So there's a lot of platforms that kind of do what I'm doing, but they target a much bigger audience than what I'm targeting, which is just like the retail person selling some sort of digital good. Um, and they do it by adding username and password. When the person you know buys, they get like a generated user password that they can only use once. Um, so to mitigate some of that, I've been thinking about doing some fingerprinting to ensure that, okay, when someone opens it, they have a fingerprint associated with every store in the database. But I've done like very minute things right now where you can have download restrictions where you can only download this thing once or you can only view this message once to ensure that the person selling has some confidence that their, that their asset won't be like leaked. But security is the biggest thing, right? Like how am I storing? People trust me to put their digital asset. It's got to be encrypted at rest. Like all this stuff is also provided by Blackblaze and Planet Scale and so on and so forth. Um, and that has to form in the customer trust of you using the platform as well. Right. And is that a custom in-house solution that you developed to kind of you know handle all this? Because it sounds like yeah, you know, when you provide is. the links, you're gonna have to you know figure out you know who gets access to what, the timeouts and you know. Et cetera, et cetera, Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So I actually introduced something newer into my stack recently, which is called Upstash. I don't know if any, um, it's like a way to host Redis <laughs> like globally. Um, and I've been using that to monitor a lot of the fingerprinting and a lot of the caching layers that I need to, so that, um, that someone who paid for the asset has access to it based on just like internal algorithms. Nice. Mm -hmm. So let's switch to, I guess, some of the lessons that you've learned from, you know, doing all this. Cause I think that's quite interesting too, because mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest lessons I guess you learned? Because obviously the first, this, has this been gone for a few months? I can't want to get a scale. You know, yeah, so, this. so like I built the core prototype of what I was trying to do in a couple of weeks. And then, you know, like the 80% of the work was done there. And then the 20% is always a long time, which is styling the website, making it accessible, so on and so forth, right? Um, the biggest lessons that I always learned from these projects is how can I become faster on my next project? And there's right. some, like, I just want to become like way faster at spitting out projects and me to learn, right? Um, there's a lot of lessons. There's a lot of uh, 
things that are happening in the React ecosystem, especially with something called Remix, which just came out. Right, I don't know if you've right. heard of it, right? Yeah, yeah, it's brand new. Yeah. Which is very fascinating to me, which I can kind of use to make it faster. So I have a Next.js API. I also, uh, I use Next.js, but I also have a GraphQL API from the admin interface. And that's how React talks to GraphQL and does a lot of uh, mutations in the background to ensure like you're creating these links, right? But mm -hmm. Remix has their own method of doing data fetching and data storing and so on and so forth. So I feel like if I'd gone that way, it would have been even faster. Like I didn't have to wrap all my stuff in a GraphQL API. I, I could have used their data fetching practices to make it even faster. I could use the core models that I'm abstracting with the GraphQL API. Um, right. So the biggest lesson for me is like, how can I keep going faster? Like what I just want to get as fast as possible for especially creating from like from an idea to an MVP, right? Even though this took two weeks, how can I make it a week? And there's lots of stuff that I always get caught up of like over-optimizing or making features that don't really make sense. So it's mostly product-based now versus like dev challenges really, because I think I've encountered a lot of these in my career where I can just kind of overtake them and over compass them. Cause I've been doing this for so long that it's just really easy for me to get around. Um, so now it's just about speed and accuracy. Like how can I get faster and faster? Right, because I guess the interesting part that you mentioned is like, you know, using like, let's say the latest, greatest frameworks, you know, in this mm -hmm. case, Remix will help you kind of with your client, you know, SDK fetching you know, capabilities, yeah. right? Because I think one of the kind of big concerns that come up with developers is, you know, whether you take, decide to use a new project, you know, a new framework, let's say in your case for a yeah. project, instead of using something that you're quite familiar with where you're, you're super fast, you know, already, right? Because there's mm -hmm. obviously a learning curve towards, you know, picking up new technologies and applying them to, no, real world scenarios, right? Yeah, uh, how do you I would say like, yeah. yeah, I would say like um, when I was younger, especially in my younger careers, I used to aspire to do all this cool technology that was actually on like Hacker News and GitHub and all the mentor, all the developers I looked up to. <laughs> yeah, like I wanted to do bleeding edge stuff. And I never understood why I always just kind of did it because that was the hot thing. There was like no clear indication of it, right? I've, as I've like matured a lot in my career, I only seek technologies that will make things faster and more efficient and make me do a lot less work, right? So I chose this stack because I know a lot of the, a lot of the pain points I used to have, like I used to set up my own Postgres databases on a digital ocean cluster and talk to them. Right. Like that was brutal. <laughs> like it was not fun at all, right? And this is before digital ocean even provided like hosting for Postgres, you had to do it yourself, right? right. So I just want to, now I pick technologies that I know will work for me in a very specific use case for me to deliver as fast as possible and as accurately as possible. Uh, and that's why I'm really gravitated towards these like very hyper react frameworks like Next.js, like Remix, because they're doing things that are more traditional like we used to do back in like very early web, like server-side rendering has been happening since like the Ruby yeah. on Rails yeah, days, yeah. right? Like yeah. it's not new, it just makes sense and it's just faster for us to work in. Right, it's newer yeah. in the you know context of JavaScript frameworks like Next.js, SSR. Yeah, like, like I yeah. saw the whole progression from client-side rendering using React Router for us going back to server-side rendering to going back to static content generation. And now Remix goes back to server-side rendering. So it's like, it's, it's like, I've seen the whole progression. And at this point, it's only about picking technologies that will help me and benefit me versus like what's really hot and what's really new. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, I think you know, that's very great. I definitely think everybody here, you know, could learn a few things from the lessons that you kind of provided because these are things that you kind of run into all the time, right? Yeah. There's no right answer per se, but you know, at least understanding your thoughts at least going to mm -hmm. help everybody here kind of figure out how to pick their next technology. You know, yeah, absolutely. Go on the next, you know, mission. Awesome. Yep.